Air enters the compressor of a stationary gas turbine engine steadily at 100 kPa, 27 degrees Celsius, and 5 cubic meters per second. The engine features a pressure ratio of 10 to 1 and is designed to induce a maximum temperature of 1400 Kelvin. Assuming the cold air standard, determine or complete the following. First, the temperature and pressure at all state points. Then, the net power output. Then, the required mass flow rate of fuel, assuming that the engine runs on pure ethanol. And lastly, the thermal efficiency of the engine. First, I will recognize that I'm analyzing a simple Brayton cycle. I know it's simple, first of all, because it's in the problem statement, but also because there is no indication of any of the devices that we're going to be adding to the Brayton cycle down the road. General rule of thumb, if you aren't told enough information to deduce otherwise, assume it's the least complicated setup, or the most ideal setup. Then I will draw a system diagram. So I have isentropic compression from 1 to 2 because I wasn't told enough information to deduce that the compressor and turbine were operating at anything other than 100% isentropic efficiency. Then I have a combustion chamber from 2 to 3 that is operates isobarically. Again, isentropic expansion from 3 to 4. And then the process from 4 to 1 just completes the cycle. It is a Q-out process, so I'm calling it the Q-out box, and that's isobaric heat rejection. Next, I will populate the state point properties that I know and the ones that I'm looking for into a table. Then I will populate the information that I know so far. I know the temperature at state one is 27 degrees Celsius. 27 plus 273.15 would be 300.15. The pressure at state one was given as being 100 kilopascals. And then I was told the volumetric flow rate. Next, I know that the pressure ratio across the compressor is 10. So what does that mean about my pressure at 2? You're right, it is 10 times the pressure at 1, because the pressure ratio, Rp, represents P2 over P1 in this case. Therefore, P2 is equal to Rp times P1, which is going to be 1,000. Do I know any other pressures? Well, I know the pressure at 2 and 3 is constant because the combustion chamber operates isobarically. And I know the pressure at 4 and 1 is constant because the Q-out box is an isobaric heat rejection process. Cool, I have all my pressures already. That was easy. Then I was told another temperature, it's 1400 Kelvin. Which state point is likely to have the maximum temperature? You're right, it is T3. Why is it T3? Because the heat addition process is from 2 to 3, and generally speaking, the highest temperature is going to occur after the heat addition process. Furthermore, we could think through this process. We have a compression process from 1 to 2 that will increase the temperature. Then I have a heat addition process from 2 to 3 that will also increase the temperature. And then I have an expansion process from 3 to 4 which will drop the pressure. And then I have a heat rejection process from 4 to 1 which will also drop the temperature. Therefore, the highest temperature will have to have occurred at state 3.
Is the volumetric flow rate the same at 2, 3, 4, and 1? No. Remember that the mass flow rate is the same, but because the gas may have a different density, that does not mean that the volumetric flow rate is the same. There is a such thing as the law of conservation of mass. There is no such law for the conservation of volumetric flow rate. So all I really know about the volumetric flow rate is that it is 5 cubic meters per second at state 1. Well, let's leave the volumetric flow rate aside for a moment and think about T2 and T4. How do I come up with those two temperatures? Well, if I look at the process from 1 to 2, I have an isentropic compression process of an ideal gas, and because I'm using the cold air standard, I know that the specific heat capacity will be constant. So, because it's an isentropic process of an ideal gas with constant specific heats, I'm going to return to our good friends, the isentropic ideal gas relations. Now, which form is going to be the most useful to get from T1 to T2? It's this one here. I know P2 over P1. That's RP. It's 10. And K for air, I can look up. Therefore, T2 would equal T1 times RP raised to the K minus 1 over K. So that would be 300.15 multiplied by 10 raised to the power of, for K at 300 Kelvin, we turn to table A20. On table A20, I have the CP value, the CV value, and the K value for air as a function of temperature. And what I want is 300 Kelvin because that's the temperature used by the cold air standard. So I'm going to use 1.4 as my value. So if I pop up my good friend the calculator here and take 300.15 multiplied by 10 raised to the 0 0.4 over 1.4, I get 579.499 Kelvin. Then from 3 to 4, I have an isentropic expansion process, so I can still use the same equation, except this time it'll be T4 over T3 is equal to P4 over P3 raised to the K minus 1 over K. Therefore, T4 is going to equal T3 multiplied by the proportion P4 over P3 raised to the K minus 1 over K. Now, is P4 over P3 10 or 1 over 10? That's right, it's 1 over 10. This is 1 over RP because the pressure ratio is the big pressure divided by the small pressure. So then T4 would equal T3 multiplied by 1 over 10 raised to the 0 0.4 over 1.4. T3 was given. It's 1400 Kelvin. Therefore, I'm taking 1400 multiplied by 1 over 10 raised to the power of, not P, 1.4 minus 1 divided by 1.4. We get 725.126. Neat. And while we're looking at these temperatures, I will point out that having a maximum temperature is often a design criteria of a gas turbine engine. You typically want as much power or efficiency as you can get from a given size, and that will come from having higher and higher maximum temperatures. So you typically want the highest temperature that you can have reasonably in your engine. And the failing point for a lot of these gas turbine engines is the design and material used in the turbine blades. 
Depending on the design and cost of your turbine, you might be able to withstand a higher maximum temperature, but regardless, the maximum temperature is something that you design around. Anyway, now that we have temperature and pressure, we could move on to part B, but I don't wanna. Let's calculate some volumetric flow rates. We don't need them. They're not gonna be useful, but they will be fun. So how do we do that? Well, we know the mass flow rate is going to be the same at all four state points. How do I know that? Because each of these devices in the cycle is a steady flow device. They're all flowing steadily. And if each device is operating steadily, then there can be no change in the mass of the system with respect to time. Therefore, the entering mass must be the same as the exiting mass. And because there's only one mass flow rate in and one mass flow rate out for each of these devices, that means m.1 is equal to m.2, which is equal to m.3, which is equal to m.4. Now, if we could calculate the volumetric flow rate corresponding to a mass flow rate, we could determine the volumetric flow rate for 2, 3, and 4. But in order to do that, we have to have a mass flow rate first. So which state point can we calculate a mass flow rate for? That's right, it's state 1. Here, the useful form is going to be m.1 is equal to density times volumetric flow rate 1, which is equal to volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume. Since the air is an ideal gas, I can describe the specific volume in terms of temperature and pressure, as well as the specific gas constant for air. Therefore, m.1 is going to be volumetric flow rate 1 divided by R of air times T1 divided by P1. See, I told you this was going to be fun. So volumetric flow rate 1 was 5 cubic meters per second. P1 is 100 kilopascals. R of air is 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And T1 is 300.15 Kelvin. Again, the specific gas constant for air is going to be the universal gas constant divided by molar mass for air. Universal gas constant is 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. The molar mass for air is 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. That gives you approximately 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now, Kelvin cancels Kelvin, but nothing else really cancels immediately, so I will break apart the kilojoule and the kilopascal into their component parts. A kilojoule could be described as a kilonewton times a meter, and the kilopascal could be described as a kilonewton per square meter. And now kilopascals cancels kilopascals, kilojoules cancels kilojoules, kilonewtons cancels kilonewtons, square meters and meters cancels cubic meters, giving me kilograms per second. Therefore, if I pop the calculator back, and I take 5 times 100, divided by 0 0.287 times 300.15, I will have a mass flow rate. So the mass flow rate of air at state 1, and therefore everywhere, is 5.8 kilograms of air per second. Henceforth, I will just be calling that m dot air. Now that I have m dot air, I know m dot 1, m dot 2, m dot 3, and m dot 4, I can determine the rest of the volumetric flow rates. Yeah, let's do it. I'm going to use this relationship here, except solved for volumetric flow rate. So volumetric flow rate is going to equal mass flow rate times R of air times temperature divided by pressure. So if I plug in m.1, t1, and p1, I will get volumetric flow rate 1. And if I plug in m2, T2 and P2, I will get volumetric flow rate 2. All the mass flow rates are the same, so I will just call that m dot air. And we can start rolling. Oh, 
5.8 kilograms of air per second multiplied by 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times our temperature at state 2 was determined to be 579.499 and our pressure at state 2 was 1000 kilopascals. And again, in order to get kilojoules and kilopascals to cancel their relative components, I'm going to break them apart. A kilopascal, not to be confused with a squiggle, can be written out as a kilonewton per square meter. And a kilojoule can be written out as a kilonewton times a meter. Now, a kilonewton cancels kilonewton, kilopascal cancels kilopascals, kilojoules cancels kilojoules, square meters, and meters cancel nothing because they're what I want and kilograms cancels kilograms Kelvin cancels Kelvin seconds in the denominator so v dot 2 is going to be 5.8043 multiplied by 0 0.287 multiplied by 579.499 divided by 1000 and I get 0. 965. And then for state 3, I would just change state 2 to state 3. So V bar dot 3 is equal to m dot air 3 times R of air times T3 over P3. And since P2 is equal to P3, the only thing I have to change is my temperature. Instead of 579, I'm going to be using 1400. So the volumetric flow rate at the inlet to the turbine is 2.332. And then one more time for all the beans, I change P3 to P4, I change T3 to T4, which was 725.126. I suppose I can just scroll up and grab that. And I have 12.079. So that was fun. Nothing builds character like calculating stuff that you don't need. I mean, we could come up with more categories of things that I could calculate here, but we should probably move on. I mean, we could come up with more columns of stuff to calculate, but I think that's enough character building for now. Now, next, I don't want to calculate the net power yet. I want to calculate the specific work in, the specific queue in, the specific work out, and the specific queue out. Again, not specifically necessary but a good opportunity to explore the cycle a little bit more. And since this is a stand-in for all simple Brayton cycles, we might as well be exhaustive in our analysis. So if you've been following along with the auto and diesel cycles, you probably know what's coming here. In order to solve for the specific work-in, I have to do an energy balance on all of the places where work-in appears. Luckily for me, that's only one device, the compressor. So in my compressor, I have an open system operating steadily. There's work in, and because it's isentropic, that implies adiabatic. So I'm drawing fuzzy lines to indicate perfectly insulated. So it begins, like all energy balances, with delta E is equal to E in minus E out. And then I'm going to divide by dt in order to write dE dt is equal to E dot in minus E dot out. And then dE dt is zero because of steady state. Therefore, E dot in equals E dot out. It's an open system, so energy could enter or exit as heat transfer, work, or the energy associated with a mass crossing the boundary. I will write that as Q.in, work.in. 
and the sum in of m dot theta. Then energy could leave as q dot out, work dot out, or the sum out of m dot theta. Then I can begin to cancel irrelevant terms. I have an adiabatic process because isentropic implies adiabatic. Therefore, Q in and Q out disappear. I have a compressor, so the work is only in the inward direction. And then sum in of m dot theta is really just m dot one theta one. And the only outgoing mass is state two, so that summation becomes m dot two times theta two. Then remember that theta for the entering or exiting mass is its enthalpy plus its specific kinetic energy plus its specific potential energy. Therefore, I'm writing power input plus m dot one times h one plus v one squared over two plus g z one is equal to m dot two times h2 plus v2 squared over 2 plus gz2. Next, I recognize that I don't have enough information to relate the inlet and outlet velocities because I don't know the cross-sectional areas and I can't determine the average velocity of a volumetric flow rate if I don't know the cross-sectional area. Plus, it's reasonable to assume that all of the work in is going into enthalpy and not much is going into kinetic energy because, again, if we don't know enough information to deduce otherwise, we assume ideal operation. Therefore, I'm assuming V1 is approximately equal to V2. Therefore, the specific kinetic energy terms disappear. Again, that's not because there is no kinetic energy. It's just that whatever it is at state 1, it's about the same at state 2. Similarly, I was given no information as to a change in elevation, so therefore it's reasonable to assume that the height difference between state 1 and state 2 is minimal. Therefore, I'm neglecting the change in specific potential energy as well. That leaves me with m.1 h1 and m.2 h2. Then I recognize that I'm looking for work in, so I will solve for power input. That would be m.2 h2 minus m.1 h1. And then I recognize that my mass flow rate is the same at 1 and 2, so I will factor that out. And I can write power input is equal to m dot times h2 minus h1. But I didn't write power input up here, now did I? I wrote the specific work in. Therefore, I'm going to write this as a specific work in, which would be a power input divided by mass flow rate, which is mass flow rate times H2 minus H1 divided by mass flow rate. Therefore, my specific work in would be H2 minus H1. And because I've assumed constant specific heats by using the cold air standard, that would be Cp times T2 minus T1. Therefore, for work in, I can write H2 minus H1, which, because of the cold air standard, is equal to Cp times T2 minus T1. Why don't you try the other three energy balances on your own? All three of them will get to right here. And the only difference will be which terms you cancel in this step. For the compression process, we had neglected heat transfer because it was an isotropic process and work out because our work was only in the inward direction. For the combustion chamber, I'm going to neglect works because it's a control volume, there's no opportunity for boundary work, and there's no indication of any other types of work occurring, and I'm only going to be using Q in because it's a combustion chamber, therefore I can cancel Q dot out. Therefore, my specific Qn is going to be uppercase Qn divided by mass flow rate, which is going to be m dot times h3 minus h2, because at that point, 
I would have canceled these specific kinetic energy terms again and these specific potential energy terms again. And I would have m dot times h3 minus h2. And then I'm dividing that by m dot, which yields h3 minus h2. The turbine energy balance looks very similar to the compressor, the primary difference being that instead of only looking for work in, this time I'm only looking for work out. Therefore, I'm going to be left with total power output is equal to m dot 3 h3 minus m dot 4 h4. I factor out the mass again, and specific work would be m dot times h3 minus h4 divided by m dot. That time it's inlet minus outlet because I have workout appearing on the right hand side of my energy balance. For Q out, I'm looking at the Q out box. I have no works because it's boring. There's no change in volume, so I have no boundary work. There's no indications of any other type of work. And I'm neglecting Q in because heat transfer is only in the outward direction. It's a cooling process. I neglect specific kinetic energy and specific potential energy again. And it simplifies down to H4 minus H1. Again, it's beginning minus end. And all three of these become Cp times T3 minus T2 and Cp times T3 minus T4, and Cp times T4 minus T1. Before we move on, I will point out that I would discourage you from just writing down these as like the Brayton cycle equations in a notebook somewhere, because your state point properties might be different. You might have different processes occurring between different state points. I mean, if we had called state one over here, and then two over here, and then three over here, and four over here, all four of those equations would be different. Furthermore, as I start adding more stuff into my Brayton cycle, my analysis is going to get more complex, and it's much more useful to be able to build these on the fly for any cycle in front of you, as opposed to relying on predefined notes all the time. So again, I would discourage you from just writing down a section in your notes as, the Brayton cycle equations. Similarly, don't write down the auto cycle equations or the diesel cycle equations. Just understand how to build them for the thing in front of you. Since I know all four temperatures, once I look up CP, I will be made in the shade. So for CP, we go back to table A20, and for air at 300 Kelvin, CP is 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Therefore, I'm taking 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin multiplied by a temperature difference in Kelvin, which will give me a quantity in kilojoules per kilogram. If I pop up the calculator again, we can get started on this. 1.005 multiplied by 579.499 minus 300.15 yields 280.746, and then 1.005 times 1400 minus 579.499 yields a QN of 824.604, and then 1.005 times 1400 minus 579.499 yields 824.604, and then 1.005 times 1400 minus 725.126 yields a work out of 678.248, and 1.005 times 725.126 minus 300.15 gives me Q out. 427.101. Okay, so we had 280.746. And then 824.604. And then 678.248. And then we had 427.101. So 
So from this, we can determine a specific network out. Which would be work out minus work in and a specific key transfer in. Which would be Q in minus Q out. That specific network out was 678 minus 280. And I get 397.5.02. And for Q in minus Q out, I have 678 minus... No, that's not right. Hold up. That was 824 minus 427, which is 397.502. Because they match, that's a good indication that I built these four equations correctly. Yay. And you probably know what's coming next. I mean, after I move these equations out of the way, of course, just a little bit of a scooch. That's right, I want to calculate the thermal efficiency. So the network out is 397.502. I guess I should write that down. Is the network out divided by Q in? Okay, let's try that again. 397.502 divided by Q in, which was a number that started with an 8, and that was 0 0.48. Okay, so again, we didn't need all of those steps actually calculated. We could have gotten to the actual answers by determining only the quantities that we actually needed, but we took an, a couple of additional steps to just, you know, get us used to analyzing this particular type of power cycle and the different ways in which we can evaluate parameters. But now that I have this information, I will actually start working on what I need. So part A is done. That's up here. For part B, I don't have the net power output yet, but I'm pretty dang close. The net power output is just going to be the mass flow rate of air times the specific network out. See guys, aren't you happy that I made us calculate the mass flow rate of air even though we didn't need it? Because if we didn't have it now, we would have to calculate it now. And that would just be chaos. So we have 5.8043. 5.8043. How far on my calculator do I have to scroll up in order to not just type it in? And then we are multiplying by our specific network out, which was 397.502. And I get 2307. Now, what are the units on that? That is an excellent question. I'm taking a quantity in kilograms per second, and I'm multiplying by a quantity in kilojoules per kilogram. The kilograms cancel kilograms, leaving me with kilojoules per second. And that is the definition of a kilowatt. Therefore, I have 2,307.2 kilowatts. Let's try that again. Much more better. Okay, part C, I want the required mass flow rate of fuel, assuming the engine runs on pure ethanol. So for that, we are going to be relating the mass flow rate of fuel to the amount of heat generated by burning the fuel. For that, 
I need to use the heating value of our fuel because the amount of heat emitted by burning the fuel is going to be the mass flow rate of fuel multiplied by the heating value of the fuel. So if I get like 30,000 kilojoules for every kilogram of fuel burned, then if I multiply that quantity in kilojoules per kilogram by a number of kilograms per second, I will get a rate of energy emitted. And then like with our analysis of the reciprocating engines, we are going to be assuming ideal combustion here. So all of the heat is going into the air. We have perfect heating efficiency. Therefore, Q dot in is equal to Q dot fuel. And Q dot in is just going to be M dot air times the specific Q in. And the Q dot fuel is again M dot fuel times heating value of the fuel. Therefore, M dot fuel is M dot air times little qn divided by the heating value of the fuel. We have m dot air, we have specific heat transfer in. All we need is the heating value of the fuel. For that, we go back into our tables. And this time I am looking for table A25. So if I scroll down on this table and find ethanol, we again see that we have two options. One is the ethanol in gas form, in vapor form, or in liquid form. Well, I'm treating this as vaporized fuel, just like we did in the reciprocating engine analysis, and we are going to be using the lower heating value because we don't have some hyper-efficient natural gas furnace here. We just have a box with a bunch of fuel being sprayed into it with a big fire constantly going. So the lower heating value is the right column, therefore I'm using 27,720 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's from table A25, heating value of ethanol is, that was, 27,720. Yes, calculator, scroll up. Thank you. Very helpful. All I want to do is write a number. Didn't realize it was that hard. Okay, and again, that's kilojoules of energy produced per kilogram of fuel burn. So now we can take 5.8 kilograms of air per second. And then I'm multiplying by a number that starts with 8. I will pop up the calculator so that I don't have to scroll up and hopefully avoid at least a little bit of nauseation. And that would be kilojoules per kilogram of air. And then I'm dividing by 27,720 kilojoules of energy produced for every kilogram of fuel burned. And kilograms of air cancels kilograms of air, and kilojoules cancels kilojoules, leaving me with kilograms of fuel per second. So I'm taking that 5.8 number, which is here. Is it worth backspacing as opposed to scrolling up? Probably not. So 5.8043 multiplied by 824. Let's scroll on up. And then we are dividing by 27,720. And we get 0 0.1726. That's kilograms of fuel burned every second quite a bit of fuel. So we knew the volume of the gas tank, we could figure out how much mass of fuel could fit in that, if we knew the density of ethanol, and we could figure out how quick it would take to drain the fuel tank. Lastly, I wanted the thermal efficiency of the engine, which I already calculated. 
Hooray, we did it. We quantified all of the things. And we could be done, but in the interests of character building, it'd be a shame to let this go without drawing a TS diagram. You'll notice that I'm saying TS diagram as opposed to PV and TS diagrams, because for open analysis like this, where the mass flow rates are all the same, the PV diagram is not particularly helpful. Instead, it's more useful just to look at the TS diagrams. So I will draw a TS diagram. We've gone over this a few times already, but just to recap, movement to the left on the TS diagram represents Q out. Movement to the right represents Q in. And we can reason through how many horizontal locations we have on our TS diagram by thinking through the heat transfer processes. From one to two, we have isentropic compression, which is going to be no horizontal displacement. And then I'm going to erase the parentheses around my S because that was a mistake. And then we have the process from 2 to 3, which is isobaric heat addition. So from 2 to 3, we are going to move to the right on our TS diagram. That doesn't mean directly to the right, that just means we have some horizontal displacement to the right. And then from 3 to 4, I have isentropic expansion. Again, no horizontal displacement there because it's an isentropic process. And then 4 to 1, I have isentropic heat rejection, which is Q out, which is movement back to the left. Therefore, I have two different horizontal locations, 1 and 2, and 3 and 4. Then for the temperatures, I recognize that I have a low temperature, and then I go up a bit for T2, and then I go up more for the fire. So that would be 1, 2, 3. And then 4 is going to be back down because I have isentropic expansion. I don't know the relative position of 2 and 4 from just thinking through the processes alone. Luckily for us, we calculated an actual number. 4 was higher than 2. Therefore, I'll put 4 here. And since I'm drawing these as state points, I will get rid of the unit there because it's not 1, 2, 3, and 4 Kelvin. And now it's my favorite game. Just connect the dots. One, two, three, four. And then we will draw one to two as a vertical line because, again, isentropic. Three to four is a vertical line because, again, isentropic. Two to three is going to be an isobaric process in the TS diagram, which is a curve. And one to four is an isobaric process, which is also a curve. Technically speaking, I didn't draw three and four quite high enough to be actually aligned with their descriptions over here. But you know what? I think it's fine. And then Q in is going to be the area under the curve from 2 to 3. Q out is going to be the area under the curve from 4 back to 1. Therefore, the difference between the two, this region enclosed, is going to be the net heat transfer in the inward direction. Now we could be done, but there's probably more stuff we could calculate for this. Ooh, I've got one. How about the back work ratio? Sometimes when we are talking about axial devices, in this case a compressor and a turbine that are driven along the same shaft, it is useful to describe the proportion of work out that goes back in to power the input devices. So in this case, that would be the proportion of work out that goes back to power the compressor. You could think of that like, how much of your raw revenue is going back into the business to make that revenue happen? That back work ratio, which is abbreviated BWR, is just work in over work out. And it is a percentage that represents how much of your workout has to go back and power the compressor. That should be easy because we have both of those quantities calculated already. So I will take the work in divided by the work out. That work in term was two eighty. The work out term was I know at this point I definitely could have just retyped the numbers, but you know what? This is what we're doing. 
And we're dividing by 678. And just putting two numbers back to back. And we get 0 0.4139. Therefore, my back work ratio is about 41%. So that's how much of the work produced by the turbine goes into powering the compressor. So I guess that's pretty much everything that we can calculate reasonably for this. So I'll just pose a couple of questions for you. What if I were to ask you a question like, how would changing the pressure ratio affect the thermal efficiency, let's say? Or how would it affect the power output? Or how would changing T1 and P1 affect our power output or thermal efficiency? Or how would changing the maximum temperature affect the power output or the thermal efficiency? Well, most of those you can reason through on the TS diagram. For example, that pressure question. If I change the pressure ratio from 10 to 11, how would that affect the thermal efficiency? And I think that the easiest way to think through that is by visualizing the proportions on the TS diagram. Our lines of constant pressure, this is P low, 100 kilopascals, and P high, appear as curves in the TS diagram, and they increase their vertical position as the pressure increases. So 1,000 kilopascals is higher than 100 kilopascals, so 2,000 kilopascals would be even higher than that. Therefore, 1,100 would be a little bit higher than a thousand. Now, remember, the region enclosed represents our net Q in, which is the same as our network out. And the area under this curve from two to three is our Q in. Network out divided by Q in, which would be Q net in divided by Q in, is our thermal efficiency. It's the visual proportion that this region takes up relative to this region. Maybe that'll make more sense if I draw it with a different color here. So the very crude representation of the red hatches divided by the very crude representation of the blue hatches is our thermal efficiency. So if you move the top line up, you are increasing Q net in, therefore increasing network out, and also increasing Q in. And you're increasing them by the same quantity. So how does that affect the thermal efficiency? It increases it. I mean, if you had 1 divided by 2, that's 1 half. And if you had the same amount added to both, that would be a higher number. Therefore, moving the top line up, increasing the maximum pressure, is going to improve the thermal efficiency. Then we could think through something like, well, what about increasing the maximum temperature? Well, with a higher maximum temperature, we are essentially moving the right line further right. And because the lines of constant pressure get further apart, the further to the right you go on the graph, they are diverging from each other. You are adding more region here than you are proportionally anywhere to the left. Therefore, you are also improving the thermal efficiency. Or what if I ask you a question like, what if you were to increase the low pressure? If the incoming pressure was 125 kilopascals instead of 100, how would that affect the thermal efficiency? Well, Q net in decreases, Q in stays the same, therefore a lower thermal efficiency. I think thinking through this on a TS diagram is the easiest way to answer those sorts of questions quickly. If you want to be more exact about it, you probably know where I'm going next. That's right, you should open this in MATLAB. This analysis here is the same analysis we went through by hand, except performed by MATLAB. And the advantage of this is I can change a quantity and observe the effects immediately. So instead of a pressure ratio of 10, you can change that to 11, and instead of a thermal efficiency of 48.2%, I get 49.6%. And if I were to change RP back to 10, and then increase the pressure, 
But remember that I said moving the bottom line up and not affecting the top line, so I have to change my pressure ratio to keep it at the same pressure. So change that from 100 to 200, and then change our P to 5 to keep P2 at 1,000 still. That's 36.85%. The thermal efficiency has dropped. Neat, right? Right. We could even make MATLAB plot the thermal efficiency as a function of RP. But since we've done that for the last couple of examples, I will leave that as an exercise for you guys, if you are so interested. Again, this MATLAB code is posted on D2L for you to play with. I think it's a good time.